air at the bottom of the page or create a watch party so that others may participate uh, in this word that we're going to be giving this evening. Uh, I've been commenting on current issues that are related to the coronavirus, and I shall continue to do that as I feel led, uh, but I have a greater concern than that. Many are worried about whether the economy will ever recover. I'm worried about whether people will ever recover. Because we were created to live in community, and it's not good to be alone, the physical distancing connecting to the coronavirus is damaging us in unimaginable ways. Every indicator, anxiety, depression, drug use, alcohol use, PTSD symptoms, suicide, are all rising. One of the indicators of the damage to humanity that few are talking about is despair. A very brief definition of despair is hopelessness. In America, there is a rise in deaths of despair. That is preventable deaths due to suicide, opioid, and other drug overuses, and deaths related to poor health behaviors. The U.S is the only rich country in the world where mortality rates are increasing rather than falling. The despair that is connected to the meaninglessness of modern life in America is what we're talking about. While conservative Christianity continues to preach that everything will be all right, anyone with eyes can see that things are not all right in America. If you are African American, bad times didn't start with the coronavirus or the death of George Floyd. We have been fighting despair in this country for 401 years. The black church has always helped us to forestall despair, but it has lost a great deal of its relevance. I've been doing extensive reading on the writings of Canadian theologian Douglas John Hall. Dr. Hall has called attention to the anxiety of meaninglessness and emptiness that he believes afflicts the general public of North America. His view comes from the view uh, of salvation history and the context in which it has developed. When answering the question, what does God do for us in and through Jesus? Dr. Hall believes that the specific types of atonement presuppose different readings of the human predicament. The type of atonement theories that have been developed have grown out of different phases of cultural history particularly the cultural history of Europe. So Dr. Hall draws some of his thoughts from Paul Tillich. He was a German American Christian existentialist philosopher, Lutheran Protestant theologian, who was widely regarded as one of the most influential theologians of the 20th century. Paul Tillich's analysis of anxiety in the book, The Courage to Be, is particularly useful in this connection. Tillich names three types of anxiety the anxiety of fate and death, the anxiety of guilt and condemnation, and third, the anxiety of meaninglessness and despair. Tillich claims that these anxieties belong to the human condition and are therefore always present in one form or another, to one degree or another, yet one dominates during a specific period. These three human anxieties relate to three periods of time that resulted in three types of salvation preaching. The answer to the question, what does God do for us in and through Jesus when related to the anxiety of fate and death is characterized by the idea of rescue or deliverance. This deliverance was typical of the ancient Mediterranean world it was typical of the generation I grew up in, what Europeans call the baby boomer generation. Consequently, the church preached forgiveness that delivers us from the bondage of sin. The answer to the question, what does God do for us in and through Jesus when related to anxiety uh, of guilt and condemnation is characterized by the idea of sacrifice. And although this anxiety is typical of the medieval and early Reformation period. Anselm's legal perspectives of salvation have been predominant in the Western world for uh, from the 1100s even up to today. 
This anxiety has also been dominant off and on in the latter part of the 20th century to today. The church preach that Jesus sacrificed himself to pay for our sins and facilitate favor with the Father. The answer to the question, what does God do for us in and through Jesus when related to the anxiety of meaninglessness and despair is characterized by the idea of demonstration or revelation. This anxiety was most typical of the 19th century to today and the liberal church preached salvation through the love and modeling of Jesus the Christ. Unfortunately, modern people no longer sense the need for rescue. Moreover, the conditions that supported the consciousness of guilt no longer exists. So modern people do not relate to guilt. And finally, the simplistic teaching that Jesus is simply love does not translate into understanding and accepting that love. The question that I'm ultimately interested in is what kind of preaching will it take to speak to a generation whose anxiety is meaninglessness and purposelessness? What kind of soteriology will be effective for this generation? And how do we effectively and relevantly answer the question, what does God do for us in and through Jesus? Let me restate Dr. Hall's perspective. The anxiety of the general public of North America is meaninglessness and purposelessness. I believe this is particularly a characteristic of the millennial generation. This leads to despair and hopelessness. It's one of the reasons that millennials have rejected the church and no longer consider it relevant. Unfortunately, this anxiety is more difficult to address or to preach to because it is not readily admitted. The anxiety is repressed because Americans are so fixated upon progress and success that the meaninglessness and the purposelessness is hidden under the illusion of happiness. The meaninglessness of life in America has produced a despair that is covert because it is repressed. Dr. Hall believes that the greatest theological challenge of our day is to create a soteriology or an approach to salvation or atonement theology that can address the underlying anxiety of meaninglessness. Seeking routes to escape this meaninglessness through entertainment, through spending, through gambling, through alcohol, etc., it's not uncommon. Affluent societies like America offer many gods who promise to alleviate that meaninglessness, but there are illusions. And the illusions work well in times of prosperity. When the illusions seem to work, they can often lead to addictions. But when these illusions can be seen as ineffective, especially during difficult times, people become disillusioned. Dr. Hall says that it's difficult, and it's during those difficult times, and it's during the disillusionment that we develop our true theology. So I'd say it's time to develop some true theology today. The answer to this meaninglessness and purposelessness is so foreign, so hidden to American people, that I'm gonna have to state it up front because it's gonna take everything that I have plus the power of the Holy Ghost for you to see it. Meaninglessness and purposelessness are answered by knowing that there is a creator with a purpose who created us, loved us, continues to love us, and in, has endowed us with a purpose. Perhaps we can develop that soteriology or approach to atonement or salvation preaching by working our way through the wisdom literature of Ecclesiastes. I'm not sure how long I'm gonna go on this, but I'll just go by the Holy Ghost. In ancient time, the Jews revered canticles, another name for the Song of Solomon, which means a series of songs as ultimately sublime, but they liken Proverbs to the outer court of the temple, Ecclesiastes to the holy place, the Song of Solomon to the most holy place. The holy place of Ecclesiastes represents the Israelites' relation to God in their earthly life. The book is about vanity, or the subject that, we're gonna, that we started talking about today, meaninglessness, Ecclesiastes 1, 1 through 2, New American Standard. The words of the preacher, 
the son of David, king in Jerusalem. Vanity of vanities, says the preacher. Vanity of vanities. All is vanity. The word vanity is habel. It's commonly used of anything transitory, uh, evanescent, transient, tending to vanish like vapor, frail, something vain, empty. Webster's the dictionary says of the word vain, having no real value, idle, worthless, marked by futility or ineffectualness. Solomon, who we believe is the writer of Ecclesiastes, is saying that all of life is nothing but futility. It is marked by despair, by meaninglessness, and by purposelessness. One of the questions that is dealt with in this book, in this wisdom book is, does life have a pattern? Man is forever. And when I mean use man, I'm talking about mankind, humankind. I usually use the word people because it includes male and female. It's forever trying to find the answers or to or the purpose of life. There are two questions that lie deep in the well of our being. And they are, who am I? And why am I here? Unfortunately, we are not looking in the right places nor to the right person to find those answers. People are not looking to God for answers to life problems and paradoxes. We look to science. We look to medicine. We look to philosophy. We look to psychology, the arts, hedonism, which is pleasure, materialism, and many times we look to ourselves. Walter C. Kaiser Jr. in his book, Ecclesiastes, Total Life, said that the book is about uh, man's attempt to find meaning in all aspects of God's good world without coming to know the world's creator. And, and you all know um, that I have a high respect for women and treat them equally. So I'm only using this language because uh, Kaiser uses this language in, in the past, years ago. It, it, the word is not man, the word is not humankind, the word is people, but I'm going back and forth. So Job asks many of the same questions that are asked in the Ecclesiastes. In many ways, Ecclesiastes is a companion book to Job. Solomon answers all the questions of this book as well as the book of Job in Ecclesiastes 12 and 13, the A clause. The conclusion when all has been heard is fear God, keep his commandments, because this applies to every person. Until you fear God, you cannot find out who you are. We have no being outside of the creator. We did not evolve, we were created, and we cannot find out who we are unless we consult the creator. Secondly, there is no meaning outside of the creator. He created us for a specific purpose, to represent him in the earth. When General Motors makes a car, their purpose isn't for to carry passengers on the highway. When we use that car to try to cross Lake Erie, we'll find out that it will not work. Beyond that, we will find out that we'll ruin the car because it's not being used for the purpose for which it was designed. Even so, no person can be happy, fulfilled, self-actualized actual, without fulfilling the purpose of the creator. Not only does, do people attempt to understand life outside of God, but we have a tendency to view life in parts or segments rather than as a whole. A myopic, short-term view of life will reveal many paradoxes. People are unable to understand the paradoxes of life when they are considered singly or individually. In short, what we need is God's perspective. God's perspective is whole and universal. Solomon periodically stops his investigation of life and its meaninglessness to summarize and to interject God's perspective and commandments concerning life. In the coming weeks, I'm probably going to be doing this. We're going to study what God has to say about life. He said, don't you know what you're going to talk about? I mean, remember where we are right now is so fluid that it's hard for me to say exactly where I'm going to be, even though God has been leading me, it seems like, in certain paths that seem to be right on where we are. So we'll be able to see in, in the coming weeks the cure for vanity, for futility, for meaninglessness. We'll be, we'll be able to see that the answer is relationship to God and relationship with God. Perhaps the most powerful 
New Testament expression of despair is in Mark 15, 33 through, through 34. When the sixth hour came, darkness fell over the whole land until the ninth hour. At the ninth hour, Jesus cried out with a loud voice, Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, which is translated, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now, we have done, we've done very little teaching, very little struggle, very little theology about this, this despair that Jesus registers here in the 15th chapter of the gospel according to Mark. But it, it's, it's clear, it should be clear, he appears to be struggling with despair. You ought to ask yourself a question. If that's the case, why don't we get much, um, uh, much teaching on it? Why don't we talk about it? And we'll talk about this across um, the sermon. Well, what has happened is that we have looked at Jesus through American Enlightenment eyes. In doing so, we have seen him as triumphant and we don't deal well with this dark side, the, the struggle, the cross, the scandal of the cross, the pain, what he faced when he came here. We, we don't talk about that. Remember that while the meaninglessness of the Israelites is conscious, our meaninglessness is unconscious because it's repressed and because it's repressed, we don't, we tend not to deal with it. Repression is the classical defense mechanism that protects us from impulses or ideas that would cause anxiety by preventing them from becoming conscious. So there's all kinds of anxiety. And as I've, we've talked about a little bit earlier, there are symptoms that are showing and characteristics that are revealing that we're under a great deal of anxiety, a great deal of stress, a great deal of distress, a great deal of distress despair, but we're not, it's not coming to the surface. It is not becoming conscious because of defense mechanism and because of repression. Fortunately, difficulty disrupts defense mechanisms so that our unconscious anxiety becomes anxious and our illusions of happiness and well-being become disillusions. What's going on right now, although painful, what's going on right now, although unfortunate, what's going on right now is necessary for us to come out of the illusion that everything is all right and to deal with the disillusionment that will cause us to be able to be driven to the only source of hope, the only source of meaning, the only source of purpose that we must help people to deal with. Let me say real quick that some people are saying that why don't we just preach hope to them? We've been doing that, but we preach hope without despair. We preach faith without doubt. We preach love without conflict or hatred. And so modern people don't respond to that because they're using their eyes and they are more alert and more thinking than they've ever been. They just look around and say, things aren't as, as you say they are. Things aren't as well as you think they are or as you are preaching. And guess what? They're right. Things are difficult. Things are dark. Uh, the, the struggles are everywhere. But what we're going to preach about is the nevertheless of the Bible. Glory to God. Nevertheless, I don't care how dark it looks, there is a light in the midst of darkness. Nevertheless, no matter how much struggle, we, we, how we are struggling with things, there is a, a deliverance and a release in Jesus Christ. And nevertheless, not that there isn't some difficulty going on, not that it isn't trouble, but there is a nevertheless in our circumstances when we are operating and in relationship with God through Jesus Christ and the power of the Holy Ghost. I feel like preaching here tonight because I've got a nevertheless in my circumstance. I've got a nevertheless in my life. I've got a nevertheless in situations that seem hopeless. I've got a nevertheless because Jesus brings that nevertheless. Trouble puts us in the place to consider real meaning. I'll attempt to help us to see that real meaning is revealed in relationship with Jesus Christ. 
I remember an old song we used to sing. And I, I, I don't like the song that much, but it does capture a true. It was an old James Cleveland song. When you've tried everything and everything has failed, try Jesus. Well, I, I prefer to try Jesus up front uh, and, and let him be the first answer. But the society that we live in and this book of Ecclesiastes is saying exactly that. The writer said, I tried everything. I tried uh, music. I tried uh, entertainment. I tried sex. I tried alcohol. I tried everything and it all failed. And in America, we have the same problem. When you've tried everything and everything has failed, try the nevertheless that's in Jesus. I hope they got something out of this tonight. I hope to be walking down into this and looking at it so that we might learn how to preach to the people, modern people, who are in pain and be able to speak to their pain, but speak to the nevertheless that's in Jesus. Have a great evening. I'll see you the next time. God bless you.